Okay, welcome to season four because I've declared it to be season four. The end of season two, we we uh, we switched those last couple uh, or, or to to video, video and audio. I still have the audio versions available, podcasts. Um, but we switched to to video, and we had the the uh, the fountain scene in the background. Um, also, um, in the first couple of seasons, I had um, <clears throat> I did an introduction, which was you know some of the same music and clips. And then I I came in and kind of introduced what the show was going to be and, and myself, uh, and we went on. I'm probably going to go back to doing something like that because um, I love the beginnings. It's a lot of work though, editing that together and then trying to find you know some some quote or something from pop culture. Or it didn't have to be pop culture, but often it was that fit sort of the theme in some rough way of what I was going to be talking about, uh, and that was a lot of fun. But editing those together. Uh, and it got easier like, once you got sort of a template together. But the day is kind of long. It's a minute 12, and that's a long introduction. Uh, it doesn't take the uh, love boat to get all their special guests in, in their introduction uh, on on their program. So uh, for going forward, I'm going to kind of uh, scale that back a little bit and maybe do some of the, the verbal introduction. I'm, I haven't decided on yet because I haven't edited this, this one down yet uh, to the opening. Um but I want to kind of focus uh, again back in on, on right division. And all these topics in some way or another have to do with right division. Uh, but I was listening today, um, I was mowing the lawn, and I said, well, let me let me put on something, pull up an app. And I happened to pull up the, uh, the His Channel app, <clears throat> which is the Calvary Chapel folks. And I don't know, I, I put on like current news or something, some prophetic program. Well, they had these three guys on there discussing Pentecost. <laughs> And about <clears throat> drive me mad. <clears throat> Some of the things they're saying, it just reminded me what I, which I try to emphasize on this podcast <clears throat> again and again and again. We've talked about consistency. We've talked about context. <clears throat> but it's not only that; it's consistent. I, I should write a book: consistency, context, and common sense. And some of the things that they say, and this is my always my warning, is that when you read scripture. Uh, Again, this is my opinion, but then I will I will actually put a link to that podcast. So you can listen to it in its entirety. I thought about just going through uh, point by point that they made, showing the clip from their the program, and then me commenting on it. But that would be quite an undertaking. It'd be rather long. I could do it over several. Uh, I haven't ruled it out, but I want to do it here. <laughs> Basically, um, I mean, they're saying things like uh, the Feast of Pentecost, and they had a Messianic... Jew there with him, which is fine, um, but he was he was going back to Leviticus, which I thought was fascinating because they're reading all these things in Leviticus and trying to parallel it with Pentecost in <laughs> the Acts, which is which is true, um, but that's the whole point. It's a Jewish feast, and you know the two loaves, the, the Gentiles and the Jews coming together. But they said they were saying things like, you know, and there were Pentecost, there were you know. Um, Gentiles at Pentecost and there weren't any Gentiles if there were Gentiles at, Gentiles at Pentecost they were proselytes which essentially means they were Jews right? so I get it and they just jump around and then they'll talk about uh, you know old Peter you know old Peter Peter has to get uh, trashed regularly um, for sorry I, I cleaned off maybe you noticed the difference I cleaned off the uh, the camera <laughs> wow. but Peter uh you know, gets trashed all the time for his attitude toward Gentiles, but his attitude toward Gentiles was was correct. The sun is being creepy. The sun is wanting to impose itself all over the place. This is a terrible one. This is absolutely Michael's just going everywhere. Um, hopefully that sound wasn't too annoying. <clears throat> it's not annoying at all for the audio version. But the... Um, you know, Peter gets trashed for his attitude toward toward Gentiles, but his attitude toward Gentiles was, was correct at the time when he had it um, because of the grafting in. And we've talked about the grafting in in Acts 10 of Cornelius, who was a righteous Gentile, by the way. Uh, he also got the gifts of the Spirit before he was baptized in water, etc. But you'd think if Peter saw a bunch of Gentiles at Pentecost, <laughs> it, he wouldn't have been reluctant in Acts 10, uh, sometime later, to go to Cornelius' house, right? But he was, because we talked about the grafting in and the purpose of the grafting in. 
Again, none of this is reflected in today. None of this. Anybody who claims Pentecost, because they're saying, it's the birthday of the church, the birthday of the church. It's nothing like the birthday of the church. Um, we've talked about the book of Acts a number of times and how it's not, <laughs> nobody's, we're an Acts church and, and they don't do anything that's in the book of Acts. Or if they try, they, they fail miserably. Um, they don't, and if you're going to do some, you got to do all, right? <clears throat> so we talked about that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I know this is coherent, as most of these things are. But it was a very difficult thing to listen to because of this whole concept of, of just imposing upon it church history, right? And just tangentially to that, I was watching um, some videos. I just started watching uh, three parts. It's going to be a nine-part series. I think the first three parts are out um, at the... Uh, YouTube site Magical Mystery Church, which I love that title, the Magical Mystery Church, um, and it's it's about mysticism that's crept into the church, and which is in many ways come through the Catholic Church and the Catholic mystics, and we've pointed this out before, and I'm glad that she does too on the video, the first one even that I was watching, that uh, you know the Passion of the Christ is not based on the Bible, it's based on based on the visions of a Catholic mystic, right? Because uh, that's that's Mel Gibson's thing, uh, so that's why there are you know it is as it was. The Pope said, "Well, no, it's not. It is as that vision was, but there's errors in it." I've said this before sometime whenever I talked about the Passion season one or so. That um, <clears throat> I watched only forty minutes of it. I had no interest in seeing it, but it came on cable one night when I was doing the laundry. This is in Alabama, many moons ago. And I watched about 30, 40 minutes of it, and it was just, oh, I could do error, 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 not biblical, not biblical, not biblical, not biblical. I mean, biblical characters, biblical uh, chronology, uh, but what the things that were going on in the scenes were not biblical, right? And even up to the, the crucifixion itself, <clears throat> you know, the demonic presence there and all those sorts of things. Because, um, again, these are based on, on mysticism and visions and things like that and not on Scripture. But as much as, as much as, you know here that um, the, the new apostolic reformation NAR or, or the Mike Bickles or the charismatic movement that, I, that I've talked about or the Catholic movement and how they bring in all these outside things it's crept into even so-called so-called evangelical conservative Christianity uh, we know the whole reformed movement <clears throat> is uh, you know hung up on I mean R.C. Sproul I'm going to use the word you know I don't really mean it this way but it just, just to emphasize, he basically worshipped the early, early church fathers and Aquinas, particularly, who was much later, by the way, many centuries later, but still, um, people on that list of church fathers that he he worshipped, and they essentially almost become, uh, almost they pretty much are considered infallible. They are pretty much considered scripture. Uh, people will defend their viewpoint because it was taught by Ignatius, it was taught by Peter Lombard, or is, you know, taught by any. Uh, you know, um, any number of, of church fathers that we've mentioned here before when we went through them. Nazianzus or <laughs> Augustine particularly. So anyway, um, but we have to get back to Scripture. And then we have to look at Scripture not through the eyes of... See, they were saying that the Pentecost was the institution of the, new, of the New Testament, the New Covenant. It certainly was not. <laughs> you know, it certainly was not. Um, again, I always say to people, say, just go read the New Covenant. We did a message on the New Covenant in the first season. And um, again, those are all audio. First, first season's audio. The second season is primarily audio, mostly audio. Um, but I mean, there are video versions of it, but you don't see anything. You just see, you know, you see the basic screen, sort of a slide, and then, and then you hear the audio over it. So maybe I'll link it here at the end on that. Um, but certainly not the New Covenant. You, you start reading the New Covenant... Uh, and while we know that the in Hebrews 8, which repeats the New Covenant, part of it, not the whole thing, but it repeats it, the basic core of the New Covenant in Hebrews 8, which is quoting Jeremiah 31, it says that the Old Covenant is slowly passing away. Because <laughs> right? the New Covenant was going to come in. And the New Covenant concerns virgin Israel being restored. Read it. That's what it talks about. It doesn't say, say by grace, under the new covenant. You know, it wasn't that at all. And people impose that. And and it's it's a major, major, colossal error in Christendom. Now, 
You can say, Michael, who cares about you? All these other great people with big titles and lots of letters after their name for centuries have said that's what it is. But you can read it for yourself. You know, we did that on the podcast, but go read it for yourself. You can read the New Covenant. Again, and we talked about uh, Ezekiel 36, 26, and people try to impose that. It doesn't work. I don't care what your pastor says. I don't care what the seminary says. And it depends on the seminary anyway, because some seminaries are... There are, there are super double extra liberal seminaries who hand out degrees as well, you know. People who don't even believe the Bible, let alone uh, ones who are conservative who do believe the Bible, who teach very different things about baptism, teach very different things about salvation, teach very different things about the afterlife, right? Because just going to a seminary doesn't make any money. Seminaries are run, created by men, run by men. Right? They're, they're completely um, fallible. Right? The Catholic Church is the same way. It's, you know, it's, it's built on colossal error. You know, uh, but anyway, um, again, Michael's all over the place. But uh, you know, the magical mystery church and this mysticism and this whole this whole idea of trying to bring everything together, it's it's still the, the core problem at the bottom of it is this is this dissatisfaction with several things, dissatisfaction with the scripture. Now they would never say this, but they are. If you have to go to the early church fathers to to find doctrine. You are dissatisfied with Scripture. You are saying that it is not Scripture alone. It is not sola scriptura. So that's the dissatisfaction with, with Scripture. And the other is the dissatisfaction with the finished work of Christ. And it, it's this, which is rampant in the church. Like we talked about how this, this claim of easy believism, right? It's complete nonsense. I mean, if even easy believism was so attractive, why do so few people believe it? We've said this before, and I make this point, and I should make it a lot more, is that the vast majority of what calls itself Christendom, two point whatever billion people in the world, uh, the vast majority of what calls itself Christendom is a sacramentalist, 1.3 billion Catholics and 500 million, whatever it is, half a billion Eastern Orthodox in form. They're a sacramentalist right there. Uh, and then of, of what's called Protestantism, there's a whole bunch of those who are not satisfied with the finished work of Christ. Uh, they crave, they crave uh, ritual. <clears throat> and that's where this mysticism comes in because it gives them something to do to feel like they're participating somehow. <clears throat> and then, of course, you have this entire idea of uh, what's going on in the Methodist Church, where they're, you know, now they're embracing the LGBTQ. It's their business, but... Um, I think uh, the largest sect of Methodists in Africa have separated from the United Methodist Church now, and you have others in America doing the same thing. Uh, I knew a Methodist pastor <laughs> in Alabama, and he said he'd go to the, the the conferences and he'd go to the national thing every year, and there was a small group of them that were fighting against this thing. And you know, we asked him, I said, why do you put up with it? Because he was, he was just a Methodist, and he went, I mean, fine, more power to him is what we wanted to do. Uh, but he knew he was fighting a losing battle at the time. Again, that's their business. Uh, but again, that's dissatisfaction with Scripture. Because they're getting off the whole focal point. Um, scripture is dealing with, and this is again what people do, they mishmash all the hopes. God's plan for the earth, God's plan for paradise, God's plan for the restoration of all things, God's plan for the Davidic kingdom, God's plans for Israel, the God's plans for the priesthood, God's plans uh, for... Um, what he's going to do in Gehenna, uh, uh, God's plans for different judgments, and then God's plans for the heavens and the far above the heavens and the heavenly places. You know, these are the distinctions we have to make. And if we fail to make these distinctions, we're going to get in the grave error. And that's what we've covered along. So I guess this is opening season four. It's just sort of an introduction. Um, if you're new uh, to what we've been talking about for 225 episodes, whatever we're up to, um, is this rightly dividing the word of truth? Uh, through context, um, looking at everything in their context and not just grabbing verses from here and there. And the context isn't, when I say context, it's not just, yes, if you read chapter 36 of Ezekiel, there's no way you can get out of it what everybody gets, that tries to get out of it with, the, with the, um, the, the stony heart and the heart of flesh. You can't get that out of it. Um, same thing with Jeremiah 29, 11. We talked about that specifically. And Second Chronicles seven fourteen and the Sermon on the Mount. It's not just the immediate context of the verse. Now that's absolutely important, but it's also the the context of God's plan and God's plans. Okay, season four is off to a rip roaring start. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll finish up here. Uh, if you're new, I probably lost you. 
I'm usually more coherent than this, and slightly more coherent anyway. And, I, and um, we usually have a topic of the day that we, we walk through logically. Um, but it's, again, the context of all of Scripture and the context of God's plan and God's hope and that which is before them. Uh, so, you, again, just going to, to Scripture, going to the book of Acts and assuming that that's the birthday of the church, even though nothing after that fits the grafting in. The other thing they talked about there, um, they talked about uh, Leviticus, and they talked about Acts 15. And again, for the billionth time, nobody does that today, nor would you separate Jewish and Gentiles believers and give them different parts of the law to keep, that sort of thing. It's traditional, you know, <laughs> uh, that nobody would do today, and we wouldn't accept that. Uh, but that, that's the book of Acts, not only Acts 15, it's Acts 21. Uh, also, the grafting of Gentiles um, in Acts 10. We've talked about the grafting in a million times, what it was and what the purpose was. Again, somebody that, that uh, tried to mock me recently uh, was, was talking about um, how the church is Israel, or Israel is the church and all that nonsense. And I always ask him the same thing. I said, so you're saying everything is for you. It's all you. All right, let's be simple. Let's stick with the book of Romans. Oh, come on, Mark. We got... Clearly, Romans is for us today, right? And I said, okay. If you think the book of Romans is for you today, here's what you need to do. You need to go and preach that Gentiles should not become haughty against the root, which is Israel, which means it's separate from them, by the way. And you need to t warn them that they may be cut off from the root. Just Gentiles, by the way. Gentiles might be cut off from the root. Um, now, what do you do with that? Who teaches that today? Who believes that today? That's the book of Romans. Now, again, there are many other things we can do. We can go to the book of Acts. We can go to the Gospels. We can go to the Prophets, um, which are far worse than that. But even the book of Romans, like I said, Romans chapter 9. Uh, you know, to Israel belong the covenants. To Israel belong. Now, again, Paul isn't saying the church. To the church belong the covenants. Because in the context of chapter 9, he's juxtaposing Israel. He's juxtaposing Israel against uh, the current called out. So there is an Israel. Israel does have a future. Israel does have covenants, which is completely separate from the church. And again, this is the book of Romans. This is Paul in the book of Romans, long after Pentecost, uh, after uh, the grafting in of, of Acts chapter 10, uh, <clears throat> etc. Um, so, but before the end of the book of Acts, before Paul had the revelation of the mystery. Because again, Acts 26, 22, Paul testified that he taught nothing, no other thing that was taught that, uh, taught by Moses and the prophets. He taught nothing that wasn't taught by Moses and the prophets. Whereas in this Ephesians 3, we know he taught that uh, he had a revelation from God. All right, we're going to finish there because that's sort of the... <laughs> now that I've lost everybody. Um, but again, this is just the intro to 4. And uh, we'll try to be more coherent and... Um, do some more what's going on in the world, what's going on in Christianity, and then taking it back to right division and comparing, contrasting. And we'll let you decide. It's all about you, you and God. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's no church. And uh, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing with truth. That's you. That's me. Individually. We're going to answer for our... And God knows we're limited, so it's not because of from perfection. But it's that work, the work, the workman, the workman, the workman, studying to show yourself approved, rightly dividing, cutting straight lines in Scripture. Bye -bye.